Hello and welcome to LFJ lectures number 16. Uh, this is Advocate Mehboob from Hyderabad, India. And uh, today we have with us uh, our uh, speaker, Miss Asiya Sherwani. Let me introduce her to, uh, to you. Miss Asiya Sherwani is an organizational effectiveness and interpersonal ethics practitioner and consultant who provides specialized support to organizations with interventions and programs on change management, building leadership, accountability, assertiveness, problem solving, diversity, and inclusion. After a 25 year gap or career in uh, people, I'm sorry, after a 25 year career in people and organizational capability and talent management in global corporations, such as Alcatel Lucent Micro and Microsoft since 2015. Ms. Sherwani works as an independent consultant supporting startups, small and medium sized companies, social entrepreneurs, media, new media organizations, academia and uh, NGOs and educational institutions. In today's LFJ lecture titled Legal Ethics and Psychological Aspects of Workplace Sexual Harassment, she will be talking about her work in handling grievances about workplace bullying and sexual harassment and design policy, designing policies and practices based on her in-depth understanding through interviews, focus group discussions, analysis, and most importantly, the lived experiences, testimonies, oral research and deliberations that she has been part of on a first-hand basis. Her background in ethnographic research has enabled her to observe participants and stakeholders in their real life environment. In addition to familiarizing us with some legal definitions, she will also talk about ethical and psychological considerations. The talk will last roughly 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute question and answer. Uh, one important uh, trigger warning to all the participants is that uh, in today's talk, the examples, observations and scenarios the, which the speaker will share will, will be direct and explicit. And uh, therefore, this lecture is for only those who are over 18 years of age. In case if you do not wish to be part of an explicit conversation about this topic, you could decide to leave at any point of time when you feel uncomfortable. Um, I think uh, this is a very uh, brief introduction of uh, Ms. Asya Sherwani. I'll close my uh, video and just give a moment. Thank you. I'm sharing your slide, ma'am. Yeah, ma go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Advocate Mehboob, and also for the trigger warning. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined this conversation today. I look forward to sharing my observations from the various roles I have played. I've had a chance to explore situations from various angles, uh, sometimes from inside an organization, sometimes from outside, sometimes as a member of a grievance committee, sometimes as a you know, presiding officer or an employer um, or an advisor and a reviewing authority or auditor. And most often as an organizational effectiveness consultant who has helped the team to heal and recover from a difficult experience after um, you know, the investigation is over. Um, I'm very grateful when I'm invited to deliver a lecture such as this one, because while preparing uh, for such lectures, I am forced to consolidate my thoughts. Uh, and look at overall patterns and uh, connections, which I may otherwise have missed. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to Advocate Mehboob for inviting me to this platform and to Mr. Abhay Jain, who's the governing council member of the Indian Council of Arbitration for introducing me to Advocate Mehboob. Um, let's start uh, with the first slide, uh, which, a, which, a, which defines workplace. So could we have the next slide, please, Mehboob? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so 
this, uh, you know, according to the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention, prohibition and redressal act of 2013. Uh, this is how uh, a workplace is defined. As you can see on the slide, every kind of organization is covered, right? Formal, semi-formal, informal. It could be an office. It could be a factory floor. It could be um, a warehouse, a fulfillment center, an incubation center. It could be an educational institution. It could be any state government institution. Uh, it could be a formal educational institution like a college, university, which again could be either government or private. It could be a sports institute, a coaching center, a tutoring center, a dance school, guitar classes, hospitals, gyms, spas, clinics. I want you to think why, like, you know, just look at the law. It's trying to, you know, cover every kind of organization shopping malls, retail outlets, uh, entertainment studios and organizations, travel agencies, gas agencies, petrol pumps, right? And as Advocate Mehboob said, uh, media, new media organizations, entertainment, IT, IT enabled services, all these, whether public, private, government, non-government, not for profit, for profit, family owned, shareholder owned, right? It could also be a society, a trust, a collective or an association. In the next slide, you will see that, um, could we have a change of slide, Mehbo? Yeah. So in the next slide, you will see that it could even be any place that is visited during the course of your work. So if a few colleagues are going together for field work, let's say if they are journalists or, or, or part of an NGO organization, if they're in the police force and going together to investigate a case, going to the location, um, you know, to some location, if you're a sales exec executive who does door to door selling, then that is also considered workplace because you are in that particular place because of work. Uh, it could be a client site, it could be someone's home or home office, right? It could be a hotel, a resort, a conference hall, any kind of rented space where you are having a seminar, a conference hall, um, right? Even, um, even if you are, have gone somewhere for an audition, right? Or a campus recruitment, that is also considered workplace, even the mode of transportation. So if two people are going in an auto or if they are going by train from one location to the other, so it could be transportation which we're using from, to travel from one city to another. It could also be local conveyance which you are using to go from one place to another within that same city. So all these are considered workplace, right? So look at how expanded the definitions are, right? Um, even if it is not workspace, but um, a colleague invites you to um, his home for dinner or forces you to, forces a woman team member to invite him at home. And the person cannot really say no because there's a hierarchy involved because how can you say no to a supervisor? Uh, in many cases, even those come under the category of workplace, right? So as I said, it's a very, very um, broad definition of workplace. Now the next slide we come to is, is, a, is a main slide and we're going to spend a good 10 minutes on it. So I'd request Advocate Mehboob to move to the next slide. And this next slide defines the five kinds of sexual harassment which are listed in the 2013 Act, uh, which I just talked about. And this Act is also known as POSH Act. POSH is an acronym for Prevention of Sexual Harassment. Sexual harassment is defined in exactly the same way in IPC or the Indian Penal Code, Section 354A as well. So it's not only the 
2013 Bosch Act, which defines it in this way. Uh, this is, um, it's defined in this way in the IPC as well. So let's look at each one, right? So what is physical contact and advances? So it, that could be any inappropriate touching, not even touching, standing too close to a person in an uncomfortable way, groping, grabbing, or trying to get someone else to touch you, right? So that, that these would be examples of physical contacts and advances. Demand or request for sexual favor. So this is all those constant requests for trying to meet someone outside office, right? So it could be requests for dates or sexual favors. It could be very direct. Uh, so since, uh, uh, you know, Mehboob said that we're all over 18 and we can be frank and explicit here. So some, a direct request for sexual favor could be something like, give me sex. I want to have sex with you. I can't stop thinking about you. I, I want sex. So sometimes it could be as, as direct as that. But very often it plays out in a variety of ways right? Um, so there was this one case where this particular manager asked his woman team member uh, to come out after office for uh, drinks and he told her that the entire team will be there and it's a team, team building sort of an exercise and therefore she went and when she reached she found uh, when she reached the restaurant she found that there was no one else except the manager so he had tricked her into you know going out alone with him um, another very typical scenario that i see working out is uh, in very male dominated organizations where a young woman or an intern has recently joined and you have this boys club kind of mentality right so all the men in the office are checking her out, jisko kehne, right? Is she cute looking? Is she sexy? Who will be the first to take her out? You know, kis ke saath pehle jayegi? So this very, jise kehne, predatory, competitive male behavior starts with a younger woman. And all these men who are doing this could be in their 40s. And this particular woman may be in her early 20s, right? So um, also, plan there's a you know there's a sort of a collective team effort let's try to get her drunk let's see if she will cooperate let's see how easy it is to break her how gullible she is right so it is almost part of the work culture to talk like this about much younger women colleagues right so it's it's a kind of normalized behavior to completely objectify women right? and to target this young person who has joined the organization. It's almost like a hunting expedition, if you understand what I mean. Right? So I don't know, since this talk is about to is, uh, you know, supposed to be about the psychology of such behavior, we have to really think about how we think of gender at workplace. So a lot of people, of course, they don't say it, but what they think is that women are, are in office for the pleasure of men. They are there in office to cause a certain excitement for men. That, that is their function of being in office, not to do the work that they've come to do, but to be some sort of an, you know, a pleasure giving kind of a thing for men. Another scenario I've seen is where there are these fairly nice guys yeah, who actually may fall in love or they think they've fallen in love with a woman colleague and they start making these incessant proposals, you know, meet me, go out with me. What I want to say here is just because you are nice, right? another person is not obliged to say yes to you. Right? So even if you are politely asking a person to go out with you again and again, and that person is not looking very interested or is politely making excuses because she does not want to be rude to you and she's not able to directly say no. Um, under this law, even 
such requests, polite requests, are considered sexual harassment. Because sexual harassment at the workplace is not always about forcing and coercion, but the important key word is unwelcome. So if that behavior is unwelcome, and if it is not solicited, or if it is not enjoyed or not wanted by the other person, then even if it is polite, it is considered sexual harassment. Right? Let's move to the next one, which is making sexually colored remarks. Right. So we've just covered a demand or request for sexual favors. Now we are moving to making sexually colored remarks. So what are sexually colored remarks? These are those uncomfortable, double meaning talk, right? Uh, inquiring about somebody's sex life or commenting about their sex life, asking personal questions. Do you have a boyfriend? Do you have sex with him frequently? It may not even be about asking someone. It may be boasting about your own sex life, constantly talking about your own sexual achievements, right? Um, a few years ago, an organization contacted me as they wanted a, you know, customized program uh, on uh, for senior leaders on how not to be arrogant, delusional, and self-promoting. These were the exact words I'm quoting that we don't want our, we want you to teach our leaders how not to be delusional, self-promoting and arrogant. So a lot of business heads and managers in that organization were very prone to boasting about their accomplishments. So while doing a diagnostic study there, I was asked to meet this team of four or five uh, people um, and they were reporting to this particular departmental head who was constantly boasting about his sex life in front of the entire team. How many times a day he has sex and graphic details he would go on to. So now one or two of these team members were horrified. They were very embarrassed. They were horrified. So they complained to the CEO. Luckily in this organization, the CEO was this really um, very decent, very approachable person. And this team felt comfortable to go to him directly. Um, and when the CEO questioned this departmental head, the departmental head was very surprised. Um, that this complaint had come. His view was that this is light, jolly talk. He said, it's absolutely okay to talk like that. I like to make the work environment light. This is how we bond with the team. And he insisted that the team actually enjoyed listening to the stories. So he had totally overestimated the extent to which the listeners were happy or fine with this talk. They were not happy or fine. They may, were maybe pretending to be happy or fine, but they were absolutely not happy or fine. Right? What was a very good learning for me while working in that case was that everybody's reaction to the same incident of sexual harassment is very different. right? And we have no right to judge the kind of impact the same incident has on different people. It could be very different, right? So two team members, I told you, uh, were very traumatized. They were shocked. They were like, you know, they couldn't work. Uh, they were very, very embarrassed and traumatized. One woman team member said, oh, this doesn't bother me. I hear it from one year and take it out from the other year because this is my third job and I've had experience of men, of many men who have talked like this. So I have learned. So it doesn't bother me. It doesn't traumatize me. I listen to all this. I just say, huh? -huh and then I go back and I'm fine. I'm able to do my work. So it's really not about gender. You can see how even women respond very differently to sexual harassment. Um, now, there was one particular response, which I remember, it was from a male team member. And I think that is the response which really shocked the CEO and made him take action. And his response was that I'm not sh shocked that this man is saying all this. The bigger shock for me is how stupid is a management that hires such people, pays them such a high salary. And, and is not bothered to check what kind of behavior these guys are displaying 
and how much time of the organization they are wasting. So I don't find this departmental head so weird. I find people who hire such people and let their behavior go unchecked and who don't do anything about such behavior. I think that such people should be more ashamed of themselves. And so look at it. Think of it from the point of view of the reputational damage to the organization that is happening when we allow such people to go on, right? Uh, so the CEO got very disturbed by all the feedbacks, but this particular feedback um, even more than others. And he did a little study and he realized that this kind of showing off and bragging behavior uh, and overpraising yourself kind of behavior and blowing your own trumpet kind of behavior was very common in his organization, even in non-sexual contexts, right? So we designed for them an intervention, not only about uh, sexual harassment. We didn't only design an anti-sexual harassment uh, intervention for them, but we also designed an intervention for them on anti-arrogance, anti-boasting, and anti um overconfidence, right? So a lot of these things are kind of interlinked. Other examples of uh, sexually colored remarks. So let's say there's an English lecturer in a university who is teaching a romantic novel or a dance guru who has choreo uh, choreographed a dance piece which has some uh, you know, romantic substance, uh, romantic content to it and the way they are teaching it or demonstrating it or talking about it is very lecherous. So they're doing it in a very um, suggestive, double meaning kind of manner. So that could be another example of sexually uh, colored kind of sexual harassment. Showing pornography. So this is not only about pornographic video clips, but it even includes uh, sexually explicit texts, cartoons, jokes, right? So it would include all these kind of things. Uh, I think somebody needs to uh, mute themselves. I can hear some sound. So any other unwelcome physical, so that's the next point, any other unwelcome physical, uh, verbal, nonverbal, I think we've already covered physical, so it could be about touching, displaying body, standing too close. We've also talked about verbal, it could include things like commenting on body, on a woman's body, on a woman's color of her skin, her clothes, um, her body parts, right? It could also include unwelcome phone calls, constant WhatsApp messages, constant unwanted good morning messages with bouquets of flowers and hearts jumping up and down, um, right? So we have to notice these things. If somebody is not, they may not be sexual, but even if somebody is not replying to too many of our unnecessary messages, we perhaps need to understand that, you know, they, they might not want it or they might not be interested in it. So again, we come back to the point that it's important to understand consent um, in a non-sexual context as well, right? Um, Non-verbal is something we haven't covered so far. It could uh, be things like staring at someone, uh, winking, giving those suggestive looks, making gestures, uh, making sounds, uh, whistling, or you know, or those really lecherous, intimidating looks that we uh, we give to people. So all those could come under the category of uh, non-verbal. In the next slide, and this is a really important one, and it's titled Circumstances of Sexual Harassment. Uh, we are going to look at some of the contextual factors that play a role. I'd request Advocate Mehboob to change the slide. Um, so I'll give you a few seconds to read. If you see the first two points, right, they are about something which we call in legal language quid pro quo. Uh, that's a Latin term which means this for that. Matlab iske badle mein wo. 
So there's some sort of a exchange. It's a frequently used legal term in many other contexts, but bringing this term in the context of sexual harassment actually gives us a lot of clarity, right? So when somebody tells you, do what I'm asking you to do, uh, otherwise your job may not be safe, right? So it's this mindset of exchange. If you are very outspoken and try to create a scene, you will no longer be part of this job. You will be no longer be part of this project or this whatever special assignment, right? Supposing you're an actor, it could be, you know, you won't get this role in a film, uh, even though you might deserve it, but because you're not sort of complying to other requests that are being made, you will be denied that work. All of us might have heard of the American film producer, Harvey Weinstein, right? A Hollywood producer. So what he would do is he would call an actress for an interview in his hotel room. And now he's standing in that room in only a bathrobe or a towel around his waist. The contract which he has to sign with this actress is lying there on the table. So Matlapuri setting, the whole setting is very, very planned. The goal is to corner a person, to put a person in such a situation that it is impossible at that point of time for that person to even think and process what is happening to her. Right? And these behaviors have been normalized. And just because I've given an example from, uh, of a person from USA, please don't think that this is a problem of the West. Um, you know, I have very similar examples of uh, behavior of senior and powerful people in India as well. Right? So young women are advised that this is how it is. You know, uh, it's just a you know, sacrifice that you have to give. But look at what the law is saying. So the law is clearly saying that any sexually oriented practice, action, or threat that endangers an individual's continued employment or negatively affects her performance is sexual harassment, right? A woman may submit to a demand for a sexual favor because she wants to save her job. She wants to continue remain, you know, she wants to remain employed. Uh, she wants to get an uh, assignment, but that does not mean that she has done this willingly. When there is an asymmetrical relationship of power and authority, we cannot take willingness at face value. Right. All of us got very impressed with the film Pink, right? Rightfully so, because it taught us something that we should have always known. But anyway, it taught us that no means no. But what I'm telling you here is something uh, slightly different from that. Of course, I agree with no means no. But what I'm telling you is that even yes could mean no. So it's a slightly different concept from no means no. Even somebody's yes may actually have been a no, but that person was not able to express a no, right? This person, your manager, has control over your performance rating, your increments, your continued employment in that organization, your livelihood. You may have loans. You may be the only earning member in your family. Your financial situation at home may be difficult. And even if that's not the case, even if your financial situation at home is not difficult, you have the right to have uh, ambitions, right? You are a swimmer. You want to swim. You want to participate you know, in national level championships. You may be a PhD student who wants her thesis to be published. And now your supervisor or your swimming coach has control over your work. You are dependent on him or her to complete your work, right? So it's a very asymmetrical relationship. 
And according to this law, the blame has to not be put on the victim, but it, the blame has to be put on the person who has more authority and more power in the situation if he has uh, misused it. Right? Many times women can't share their situation even at home because family members will say, leave the job, you know, stop uh, whatever you are doing. You don't need to go for this, uh, um, you know, tournament or whatever. So the goal of the 2013 Act is clearly that no woman will be subjected to sexual harassment in any organizational space. The idea behind this is to create a level playing field for everyone, including women, and of course for men as well, and for people of all genders. The goal is gender parity. The goal is that every human being should be able to go to their place of work with dignity and with self-respect. Right? Let's look at the third and fourth point on, on remove conditions they have to remove those conditions which make sexual harassment and bullying more likely so they are telling the employers that you have to guess that what are those things which might cause sexual harassment one day and let me start working on those things before they become a problem right so this is preempting you preempt discrimination or sexual harassment so they have to make attempts to eradicate damaging mindsets and behaviors. Yeah? So all employers and managements of educational institutions, you are liable. I am not saying this. The 2013 Act is saying that it is your responsibility to take preventive actions. If you do not take preventive actions, you may be penalized under the 2013 Act. Right. So which means you have to look at the subtle factors which are causing inequalities in the workplace. You have to look at things which others don't see as a problem. Right. But you should be able to see them as a problem because you are looking at it from a preventive lens. Often managements are male dominated and they may not be seeing things from the perspective of a woman who is undergoing harassment of this kind. And let me tell you, even when managements are female dominated, sometimes they fail to take actions which protect other women, right? So it's not a man versus woman thing, right? It's not that at all. So we have to make these efforts. We have to look at whether there is sexism in the work environment. Has overall a uh, toxic culture been normalized? We have to look deeply at behavioral and psychological aspects. And as I already said, we have to look at things which right now may be invisible, right? Which means you have to get trained on gender sensitivity if you don't raise your consciousness. If you don't train yourself on gender sensitivity, you will not be able to see these invisible things. Um, and the law clearly says this, that every organization has to um, have interactive awareness programs at regular intervals. All good organizations are doing these workshops at least once a year, if not twice a year. We have to display posters. We have to display notices. We have to create an environment where it is safe to complain, right? There should be no adverse impact on somebody who is complaining. No hostility, no anger towards somebody who complains. So we have to have the willingness to take the complaint seriously. We have to make the process simple. What we very in very cleverly do is just because we want to have a tick mark on the checkbox, we make all the processes, but we make them so difficult intentionally that it is impossible for somebody to make a complaint. So if you are doing that, you're not following the law. The process has to be simple. The complaint committee has to be approachable, right? So every organization that has more than 10 employees, and remember employees are defined very broadly. So anybody who's working part-time with you is also considered an employee. So a trustworthy 
uh, internal committee has to be uh, formed. We have to create an ethos where reporting abuse and harassment is welcomed rather than questioned or avoided. Um, the, there are very strict guidelines on uh, the composition of the internal committee. It has to be headed by a senior woman who is an employee of the organization. It has to have two other members from amongst the employees. One external member who is associated with an NGO or an association or is an independent consultant who has done very credible work on gender justice um, and who has a good understanding of workplace sexual harassment, of course, the legal aspects as well, but more importantly, the psychological, ethical and societal factors, right? Um, these committees, remember, were envisioned to look at things with a lateral perspective. They are not committees which are supposed to follow the same old path which the courts follow. They are, like, they are an alternative mechanism of justice. So they shouldn't be behaving exactly in the same manner that a court would behave, right? In fact, these committees should be path breakers. They should set up new, I mean, they should create a body, a new body of work where we can you know, look at things in very new and different ways. The internal committee is located inside the organization. And that is such a wonderful aspect of this law uh, because that places the responsibility of sorting out the matter within the organization. It brings justice to your doorstep, to your organization's doorstep, right? Organizations are mandated to form an internal committee, but the state government is also mandated to form something called a LC or a local committee at the district level. So every district level should have a LC and there are rules for how an um, LC will be composed as well. You know, it will be constituted as well. Right. So in the next slide, you can see that there are some uh, powers that the ICCs and LCCs have. So there is a slide, um, I think it's titled powers of the uh, ICC and LCC. So they can ask for evidence, they can summon people, they can, um, you know, analyze the data that has come in. Right. And many state governments have done a very good job of creating digital platforms uh, through which these various committees can share best practices uh, with each other so that this good learning community uh, of experts on workplace of sexual harassment is created. Um, right, as I said, uh, the goal behind having ICs and LCs is so that justice becomes closer to your organization, comes closer to your district and it is very easy for people uh, to access them. Uh, you know, to make long lasting change, we have to work with the entire community. See, sexual harassment is a big problem, not only because of the person who harasses, but because of the enablers. So there are many people who don't sexually harass anyone themselves. But they stand there and they watch quietly or they turn their face away and they don't say a word. In many ways, enablers are a bigger problem because their numbers are very large. It is almost everyone. Think about it. Reflect a little at you know, points in our lives. All of us might have enabled sexual harassment by keeping quiet about it. Um, if you're not part of a structured organization, but you are a freelancer, you do project based work, then you can get, you know, committees created through associations, guilds, collectives. Uh, if not, you can always go to the local committee, right? Uh, recently, uh, the local committee in Gurugram, I don't know if you heard about it, uh, found a particular respondent who was a very senior person in a travel agency guilty. Uh, and they punished him, um, you know, with a monetary compensation that he had to pay to a complainant. And it was almost 11, 11 lakh rupees, if I remember correctly. So yes, that's another innovative aspect of the 2013 Act. It gives statutory recognition to the right of a woman to monetary compensation. Right? In fact, it gives you very clear guidelines 
on how to calculate that sum of money. You have to account for the mental trauma or the suffering. You have to account for her loss of career opportunities, right? For any mental, physical health uh, treatment that she may have had to have because of the sexual harassment. So this law recognizes that sexual harassment comes at a mental cost. So women who are being sexually harassed for a long time uh, start falling sick more often, right? They become very unwell. They have to go to the doctor more often. So there is a very huge cost associated with sexual harassment, which until now we haven't really thought much about. And I'm happy to see that this law considers that. So I'd like to start wrapping up by, um, you know, by telling you that uh, this is something um, that we have to look at with seriousness. All of us have to come together and, um, uh, you know, look at ways that we can change thinking, we can change mindsets. Uh, we have to look at this as an ethical problem, not only a legal problem. We have to work on uh, changing workplace cultures. We have to raise our consciousness. Um, there is one more slide which, you know, um, tells you that we have to, uh, it's called, I think, timelines. So there are very strict timelines, again, unlike the court, uh, very strict timelines if you, um, uh, if you are an IC or an LC that is investigating, you have to complete the case, complete the investigation within 90 days. And within 60 days um, from that date, uh, whatever recommendations you have made have to be implemented. So that's another uh, good feature of this uh, act. Um, right. Um, with this, I'd like to conclude. I know we are running out of time um, and I'd love to hear your comments, your you know, experiences and anything that you'd like to share. We can take another 10 minutes after that. I'll have to log into another call. So thank you so much. Back to you, Advocate Mahim. And now I think we can allow people to put on their video, especially if they're asking a question. Uh, yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it has been a privilege to listen to you. And uh, uh, amazing, amazing, you know, uh, you have been very articulate, very, what, what I can say, uh, you know, so, so much of, uh, you know, information, beneficial information has been shared. And I think I have gotten a lot of new points uh, new knowledge from uh, today's lecture i hope other people uh, may also have uh, gotten uh, you know a lot of uh, enlightenment i would say on this uh, uh, topic so i'll just go through the chat box uh, i'm sorry in the midst of the uh, session i had a power issue with my laptop so i had to you know lo log out and log in again uh, let me check out. Okay, uh, I missed one uh, question earlier. One uh, one person had asked, "What is uh, what about the domestic helps?" Okay. Yes. So this law covers everyone, um, organized sector, unorganized sector. So definitely domestic help is uh, is covered. Their workplace is the home in which they go and work, right? Yeah. Agricultural laborers are covered, construction site workers are covered. The sad part is that they probably don't even know about this law. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to see that a lot of NGOs now have started actually working on creating awareness around this. And if any of you would like to volunteer, that would be good. Um, you know, so yes, the, they are covered. And obviously there will be no IC because uh, in, in this uh, sort of a situation, but the LC, the household uh, health, uh, should be going to the local committee, which is created by the state government at the district level. So yes, they are covered under the Okay, uh, I had a hand raised by Miss Mariam. Yes, Mariam, would you want to ask an audio question or video question? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so much. It was really informative uh, session. I have a question. Um, how can I react? How can we uh, react in front of this unwelcome behavior? You know, 
as you said, uh, unwelcome behavior also is such a, a sexual harassment. And how can you show uh, the people who react like this uh, that uh, his or her behavior is wrong with us? Or is there any yeah. suggestion? Got, or... got your question. Lovely question. Yeah, and I wish organizations would do these sort of interventions. Um, you see, in organizations which have trained uh, their, not only women, but people of all gender, their employees, on assertiveness. See, in India, we are taught to be subservient. We often, when we are faced with an intimidating comment or situation, we are not able to think quickly on our feet and answer back because we freeze. And there is psychology behind it also. So if you studied neuroscience, you would know that there's something called fight or flight response. Um, and oftentimes we freeze out of, uh, of fright, right? Um, so, um, so if it would be of tremendous help if while tackling bullying behavior and uh, sort of teaching people that that behavior is unacceptable, parallelly, if we also teach those employees who may not have it in them to fight back, they may not be assertive because they have been conditioned by South Asian society to be sub, you know, submissive, to not anger anyone, to not you know, hurt anyone. So maybe a great and actually a very effective way of handling sexual harassment would be assertiveness training. Uh, which should be given to all employees. And how do you push back? How do you say no? How do you respond when you are cornered, right? I think this will give a lot of courage to not only women, but a lot of men who are gentler and who are more decent and who are not able to counter rude behavior. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I will go uh, with a question from Miss Charo Sina, I guess. Can the committee recommend the punishment? Uh, yes. So the committee does recommend disciplinary actions and those uh, disciplinary actions are binding. If for any reason, the employer, the, so the report that the IC makes is handed over to the employer and then the employer or the head of the organization is responsible for implementing them. If for some reason he or she feels that one part of it cannot be implemented, they have to properly, officially give a reason and that reason also has to be put on record. Okay, I'll go uh, to Miss Anusha Pilli. Please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm a doctor. I'm working with the state government uh, in a district called West Godavari from AP. So mine is a, a little different scenario, but I don't know if that is applicable. Uh, I feel it is not applicable to sexual harassment. But please, if somebody can help me out with this, because I I have been uh, mental and psychological harassment from my boss, and she is the district medical and health officer, and I work as a district epidemiologist. She has humiliated at workplace. She has done gender discrimination to me. And she has compared me with her two daughters because both of our professions are same. And uh, uh, and this has been very mentally torturing me. There's a loss of productivity. Uh, like you mentioned, I had uh, several breakdowns. Um, and I don't know where to go. So uh, how, how can I proceed further regarding this issue? Yeah. So what you are going through is gender-based harassment, um, right? Uh, and yes, uh, um, a, you know, I think if you do have a, an internal committee in your organization, you can take it to them. But as I said, this has to be sorted out through other policies as well. Only having a posh policy, but not having a policy around bullying, demeaning, and harassing is only half the work done. Uh, interestingly, uh, while this particular 2013 Act is only for women complainant, it does not mention whether the perpetrator 
is male or female. So the perpetrator is never addressed as either him or her, which many people have interpreted as that you can actually also complain against women. And Anusha, thank you for bringing this up because, you know, it's not only men who abuse and sexually harass. And that is why, what I was trying to say by earlier saying that this is not a male versus female thing. There are certain behaviors which are pervasive and which could be there in people of any gender. So yeah, it's a tricky uh, question that you have asked. It will require some thinking through. Uh, it will require your organization uh, to look at it from various angles. Posh could be one angle. I cannot give you a full answer right now. We need to investigate the details. It would be premature for me to uh, sort of come with, uh, you know, any one conclusive answer here. Uh, but please get in touch with me later if you wish. Um, you, can, you can take my uh, email ID from Advocate Mepo and we can discuss how you can go about it. Thank you for bringing this up. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much. Uh, I'll go to one second. Okay, uh, there's one person, I think they have not clearly given their name. They, they are asking when there is a harassment where a female employee and a male are from two different companies, uh, secondly, when a female employee handhold for a promotion of, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand the question, but uh, I think it is something relating to co people from different co companies and the stakes are about the promotion or hike and uh, it did not work out this way. Okay, so let me answer the first part. The second part, maybe uh, the participant can email to us and I will reply on email. Uh, so yes, so if there, are, and this happens very often uh, that the two people um, involved are from different companies because now we have uh, buildings in which many offices share space and a lot of people uh, sort of uh, go out for smoke breaks, etc. cetera, together, uh, right? So yes, uh, so, we are hoping that both the organizations have an IC, which they should, right? And you, um, so, so the complainant should ideally go to the IC, to the internal committee uh, of the organization to which the accused belongs, because they are the ones who are going to be able to take some action on him in case he is proven guilty. However, I would recommend that you also involve the internal committee of your own organization because they can help with conversations and they can help with, you know, um, sort of taking care of any um, interim needs or your safety needs that you may have in case this person is uh, harassing you in some common spaces, uh, which the two organizations share. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I'll take one question from Ms. Lakshmi Chetri. She is asking, what is the role of LC after IC has been submitted, uh, have submitted the action taken report? Yeah. So, you know, LC is not above the IC, right? So the LC and the IC are two bodies at roughly the same level. So if an IC is handling a case, it's the IC that is handling the case, right? And one more thing. Supposing somebody has complained to their company's IC, they can also simultaneously go to the police and complain. So there are no rules that if you have gone to the IC, you cannot go to the police, right? So we cannot say something like, oh, but you've gone to the police, so don't come to the us, uh, don't come to us, right? So you can simultaneously go to many organizations. The LC has pretty much been formed for those organizations which have less than 10 employees and therefore it's not mandatory for them to form an IC or cases where the head of the organization has been accused. Uh, so those cases ideally should go to the LC uh, because the, you know, the investigation of the IC, which sort of reports into the senior guy may get compromised. Thank you very much. Uh, my friend, uh, you know, Ibad has uh, just mentioned that coincidentally, today is the United Nations International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, strange coincidence. I'll go to the next question. From Good coincidence. <laughs> Auspicious day to do this. <laughs> 
so i'll go to the question from uh, miss farheen mirza she is asking when there are a male and female workers and uh, uh, you know the relationship can be vice versa it's that you know one is a subordinate and uh, basically they are physically involved with consent but uh, subsequently in the future one of the person is uh, blackmailing or taking advantage of you know making the other person to be submissive what is to be done where there is no uh, you know proof available yeah so this is a fairly common scenario that there may have been a relationship uh, a romantic relationship with consent and uh, so let me talk about a particular case where this happened of course without naming anyone so there was um, you know as the uh, participant asked there was a situation where two people were having um, an affair and initially uh, the woman liked the person and after a while she realized that he started becoming very controlling and very obsessive and he started recording their intimate um, encounters and then started threatening her that if you don't continue with this relationship uh, i will share these with everyone in office um so even in and, and this girl was this woman was hesitating to report because she was scared that now you know this whole internal committee will find out that i had an affair with this person they will judge me they will blame me and that's what prevented her from coming to the internal committee and that delay made situate the situation even worse right so it is you know consent if somebody consents to one thing if if a person can allow someone to kiss them on sunday that doesn't mean that that permission is valid for monday tuesday wednesday thursday and friday right so somebody can pretty much be uh, involved in um, a, a romantic or sexual act for a certain amount of time and then not want it anymore and then if the other person of any gender continues to threaten blackmail and harass that person it is still sexual harassment just because you had an affair with that person uh, just because you were in a relationship with that person does not mean that this person uh, you know can continue harassing you so absolutely this would come under the uh, 2013 sexual harassment law the ic should not be the ic or the lc should not be judging any woman any man or person of any gender for an affair that they may have previously had thank you so much i'll i'll take one last comment from miss lakshmi chetri ma'am uh, asia ma'am can comment on that she is uh, saying that many a times it is seen that ic is formed for the sake of forming but no meeting is called no awareness program is held yeah that's exactly the problem and that is why uh, people like advocate mehboob are trying to do sessions around this right so we have to speak up when there is no case yet you know when a case happens and we are fumbling and trying to form an ic obviously it will happen in a hurry the internal committee and the local committee should be formed properly uh, as a preventive measure and if people and you are very right lakshmi that people are just making these committees for the sake of making them because it's mandatory by the law we are not doing it from the heart we actually don't want to solve this problem so the few of you and i'm presuming that people like you who've come for this session or uh, who've joined this session are people who want to make a change who want to make this world a better place you have to speak up and give teeth to your internal committee you have to motivate even your internal committee you have to go to them and say uh, ma'am sir you are part of this committee can i help you arrange some preventive workshops right so what if everyone in the organization started participating in getting these things arranged and organized right instead of leaving it only on the ic instead of just criticizing the ic Yes very often ICs are formed without being brief they're just an order is passed you are part of IC and they are like oh god ye mere sar pe kya afat aa gayi hai what is this nonsense IC they don't even know what IC is or LC is right i met one very senior government officer and i walked up to her and i said oh i've heard you are part of the LC and she looked at me blankly and said what is LC i don't even know i don't know who's put my name there 
So now if that is the situation, then who is going to help us? I mean, really, you, we have this brilliant law, this profound law, which is so progressive. And we are just not bothered about implementing it or taking any action. I mean, then what is to be said? It is people like us who have to speak up, who have to, every organization that you know of, we should be going to them and asking them, are they doing interactive training? Do they have a proper IC? We should ask our women and child welfare department, can I have the details of the local committee? Um, you know, when did you last have a meeting? We should ask those questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been getting more questions, but as ma'am said, she has to go to some other meeting. I'll just end with some thanks. One person has said, very informative session. Pooja Jain says, thank you, Ms. Asiya. Huge respect the way you have presented. Excellent session. Such regular uh, open channel will surely help people. Nagina Khan says, thank you so much for a great session. Munawar Muhammad says, nicely presented and very valuable. Uh, Pooja Jain again says, you rightly enlightened one thing that uh, we forget about law. Otherwise, it's wrong to do such things. One ID says, thank you so much, madam. Jabin Bushra says, uh, a very informative session. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, Mariam Koistani. Mariam is an international student. Uh, she has been studying in Usmania University. Originally, she's from Iran. She's studying uh, law and uh, she's uh, interested more in women's studies. And uh, finally, I think... And Mariam, you are covered by this law. As long as you're in India, yeah, you are covered by this law too. So anybody yeah, in yeah. India is, is covered, yeah. Thank you. Anusha Pili saying, thank you so much for the session. One more ID says, thanks. Lakshmi Chetri says, thank you, ma'am. And uh, okay. Abhishek says, thank you so much. Noshin says, thank you so much. Benedict says, thank you, madam. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of uh, thank yous. Finally, I think I would say that we are privileged uh, and uh, very much thankful to Ms. Uh, Asya Sherwani to have uh, come to this um, online lecture or uh, you know, session by wakilsahab.com. We are very fortunate. This, is, this has been a very uh, you know, high quality, very important uh, session. Uh, for us. Thank you so much, ma'am, for coming. And uh, I thank, thank all the audience to, for joining. Yeah. yeah. yeah go thank ahead. you to all of you. Thank you to the brilliant questions. Take care and tell others about this. <laughs> this is an important law. You must talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to the audience and all of the people. If you want any other information and if you want to be aware of uh, upcoming talks by wakilsab.com, you have the number on the poster. Just contact me. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. Thanks.